Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome here, and we're so uh, glad to have uh, Dr. Ching Lu from uh, the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Florida to give a talk today. Uh, Ching uh, got his uh, PhD uh, from uh, Case Western Reserve University in 2008. Yes. After that, he uh, joined uh, Michigan State University as a, a assistant professor. Uh, and then he joined the University of Florida, where we have we are colleagues. Uh, which year was it? 2000, 2019. 2019, right? And we have been together for a couple of years, and then I came to UGA. Now, today, I, I invite him to here. Uh, hopefully, he'll find uh, uh, many people doing similar research here. Uh, Ching basically does research in uh, uh, statistical genetics and uh, statistical learning, uh, both theoretical science and uh, application science. Uh, and he has a lot of publications as, as well as grants. So uh, please, Ching. Okay, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, so can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, so this is my first time visit the University of Georgia. So I'm glad to see my old friend here and also meet uh, several of the new colleagues. We have a very good conversation this morning and probably in the afternoon. So in my talk, uh, I will introduce a uh, new new network method for high dimensional risk of prediction research. So I will provide uh, some of the background information and then introduce the method and uh, discuss some of the discussion. So my talk could be a little bit of technique. So if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Okay, and I will try to explain in more details. Okay, so I think most of us know AI, right? AI has been the driving force for the modern industry uh, and has been widely used in the safe driving vehicles, uh, speech recognition, uh, and the next generation robotic technology. So if you are interested, you can click the link below and uh, you can see a lot of amazing application of the AI. Uh, it can draw a uh, painting, it can compose a music, and uh, it can chat with you. Uh, and we actually experience AI during our daily life. When you're doing a Google search, when you talk to Alexa, Alexa, uh, you experience uh, AI. Um, and uh, many years ago, I uh, make a joke with my graduate student. Someday we will be replaced by the AI, right? So collaborator gave us the data. We just, you know, pass to the AI and uh, it can do the analysis and write a report for us, right? So now dream comes true. <laughs> now we have a chat GPT. Uh, although it cannot exactly do the job, but uh, you know, it can write a simple code, for example, for the power analysis, right? You still need to ch uh, change a little bit, make the work, but uh, it generates uh, most of the framework for you. Um, it can write a paragraph for you, although it's, it's, it's a little bit terrible at this point. Uh, and a special reference, you know, you can find that there's no reference that exists, right? Um, but uh, if you have a draft, you upload there and uh, it can, you know, kind of uh, polish the draft for you. It can crack the typos and make the language much smoother, right? And AI is evolving. So eventually I think it can take us, take most of our routine jobs, right? So we can focus on more important things, right? Uh, for example, spending time with the family, right? So, <laughs> um, so AI is not only used for the industry, it also has been increasing using in the medical research. It has been used for disease prediction and diagnosis. And most recently, it has been used for decipher the RNA, RNA and protein structures. It has also been uh, increasing using in the functional genomics, right? So among all the AI methods, now the most uh, 
popular user method, uh, as you probably know, is the deep learning or the deep neural network. The idea is based on uh, a, thing, uh, a neural network idea which has proposed many years ago, okay, called a multiple section about 60 years ago. Um, so for those probably don't familiar with the uh, neural network, uh, I usually use the uh, uh, Lego set. My uh, daughter used to be my daughter's favorite game. Now, of course, the self, right? Uh, as an example to illustrate the neural network. So the object here is try to build uh, the race car, right? Using the pieces here, right? Lego pieces here. So it's difficult to build the car piece by piece, right? So the instruction or the the strategy the kids use or the instruct, instruction tell them is we first assemble these parts based on the Lego pieces. And these parts looks more similar as the race car. And then you can easily build the car, right? And the new network is using the same idea, right? Giving the, all the inputs, or in statistics we call independent variable or covariates in epidemiology, we first build these inner units, okay? through a linear combination of all the input variable and the nonlinear transformation, okay? Nonlinear transformation. And in, in new network, we call this activity function. So this is basically a transformation function. This activity function could be very flexible, right? So basically you can use many of the nonlinear transformation, but the most popular used one is called a sycamore function. Now in statistics, we use a long, long time ago called a logic function, right? Or right now, the most popular is called the ReLU function, ReLU activation function. And in statistics, we call piecewise linear function, okay? And these hidden units can capture the abstract and the complex feature from the data, right? For example, the, the interactions, and uh, these are more powerful to model Y, okay? More powerful to model Y. Uh, a nice feature of the new network is uh, if you give the new network enough data, it can learn these uh, hidden units or the entire neural network by itself with very limited human inputs. Uh, basically, you just need to tell what structure look like, how many hidden units, and it can build the new network for you. Okay, so this is a nice feature. So similarly, if we, you give the computer enough training, the computer actually can build the, the race car by itself, right, without any instruction. So this is a nice feature of the new network. Now, of course, this is a very simple Lego set, probably cost you less than $50, right? If, you know, you try to build a, a complex uh, Lego set, which costs you $100, then it normally will involve multiple steps, right? You need to assemble the complex parts from the simple parts and eventually build the set. Uh, so similarly for new network, if it involve multiple layer of hidden layer, so here is only one hidden layer. If there's multiple hidden layer, we call deep new layer and call deep learning. Deep learning can be used for many da data, such as the genetic data. Genetic data such as sleep data can be simply viewed as ordinary variable with, with three value, zero, one, two, which is calling for the number of uh, minor frequent alleles, okay? And uh, all sleep data look very similar. So you have zero, one, two values. It's just, it's high dimension, it's high dimension, which means the P could be very large. P could be one million, right? For GWAS data is one million and uh, for sequence data there's more, multiple million. Multi-minute data. So if we denote the SNP as X and denote uh, the phenotype, for example, BMI as the Y, and if we use F func F to describe their relationship, as you can imagine, right, based on the central dogma, it's very complicated. The whole process will be very complicated, and no one knows what this F function is. So instead of trying to figure out what this A function is, you now work using hidden units to approximate this A function. Right? And based on the universal approximation theory, if you have enough hidden units, even such simple structure only have one hidden layer, it can approximate this A function very well. Very well. So this is give you an example. This is uh, 
the true function, and uh, this is just based on the data that new network to fit the function without a know what this by this is actually the bivariate uh, sine function without a know this function. As you can see, it approximates the variable. Okay, plus the variable. Okay. So this makes it the idea to for complex genetic uh, analysis, such as the genetic risk prediction analysis. Right. Genetic risk prediction model use uh, human genome discoveries and other established risk predictor uh, to predict high risk individual at early stage so that a proper prevention method can be used to reduce the mortality and morbidity. So genetic risk prediction was considered as cornerstone of the professional medicine. Now, although it's promising, it is promising to change the healthcare to from the treatment to prevention. Uh, however, the task to developing an accurate genetic risk prediction model is helped by the complex genotype and phenotype relationship, uh, and also the present state of evidence in which we can't know very few risk factors to accurately predict the human disease, most of the human disease. Right? So a promising strategy we use right now is not only limited to those known risk factors because there's only a handful of people, hundreds, um, but uh, extend to a larger number of uh, potential risk factors. For example, we can extend to whole genome, all the SNP in the whole genome, right? Um, but that could bring uh, analytical challenge because now you need to fit a model on one millionth of the variables, right? And fitting the new network on millions of the SNP data could bring serious overfitting issue. Okay. The model tends to be unstable because we have limited sample size, right, from the genetic study. So it has a overfitting issue. <coughs> and also with the advance of the technology and the reduced cost, we now have uh, genotypes for a large number of the studies, uh, study samples. So for example, for the ETI bank, we now have 100 K samples, okay? And analyze such large samples also bring the computation issue. Okay. So to address uh, the first issue, the high dimension issue, uh, linear mix model, we could uh, has, can be used as an alternative method. Uh, it has been widely used in the genetic data analysis, starting from animal breeding to recent genome-wide complex treat analysis. Now, unlike the neural network that use millions of the parameters to model the genetic effect, right, linear mix model fits the effect of all SNP as one random effect. Okay, through the following model, Y is the phenotype, for example, BMI, um, beta is a fixed effect for the covariance such as NJ and agenda. The alpha is the total genetic effect of the individual, okay? And uh, which we're assuming it follows the normal distribution. Uh, sigma alpha square is a various component. This is a parameter we want to estimate. And K is the correlation matrix, a covariance matrix. Uh, and it can be interpreted as the genetic relationship matrix between individuals. So each of the element of this matrix, so this is N by N matrix, each of the element to, is measure the genetic similarity of two individuals, okay? So for example, for individual I and J, we can measure their genetic similarity by center their genotypes, okay? So the GRK, GJK is their genotypes at the case of the locus, and the PK is just genotype frequency. So we center the, their genotypes and uh, multiple them and the sum over k. Now this k could be very large. k could be one million, okay, it can be one million. So this makes the linear mix model applicable to high dimensional data, such as the whole genome data and also whole genome sequence data, right, whole genome data sequence data. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So how do you quantify the, the genotype? A uh, genotype is the, uh, uh, it's already been coded as 0, 1, 2, which is coded for the number of uh, minor ideal. Okay. Minor ideal, yeah. So just, you know, you have two copies um, from parents, right? <laughs> yeah, if it's the same ideal, minor ideal, then will be two. Yeah, and this is just genotype frequency. Right? Genotype frequency, okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, 
okay, so the model can be also written into the following hierarchical structure, which we will use to introduce our method. Now, one of the feature of the linear mix model is it is using one parameter to measure the overall genetic factor, right? Not like the new network, you need a million parameters. So the model complexity is substantially reduced and you don't need a, a large sample to train the model, okay? And typically we use the REMO to estimate these uh, parameters, various component parameter. Uh, now notice that the REMO is uh, iterative algorithm and it's quite computational intensive, especially with the increased sample size. Okay? And it's almost impractical to use that for the UKFI bank data because it involves a matrix calculation. For example, you need to invert in a 500K times 500K matrix, okay? And uh, you really need a lot of memory to do that, okay? uh, memory to do that. Okay, so we introduced two methods for risk prediction analysis. Both has their pros and cons. cons. Uh, neural network is able to capture the complex genotype and the phenotype relationship. Uh, and is able to consider nonlinear, non-active effect, including the interaction fact. Uh, however, it can only apply to limited number of loci. Uh, when you have an increased number of uh, genetic variable, it requires a large sample to train. Otherwise, you have a poor fitting issue. The linear mixed mode on the other side can be applied to the high dimensional data, right? So it uses only one variance component estimate to model the uh, overall genetic effect. So it uh, requires uh, much less data to train. However, it could be computational intensive, especially with uh, increased sample size. And again, I mentioned it cannot be applied, directly applied to the larger scale by bank data. Okay. And also the performance of the linear mix model depends on the choice of the kernel. Okay. So for example, the, this is a linear kernel. Okay? The linear kernel we use is only can consider the linear relationship. Okay? Uh, and it is subject to low performance if uh, you have a complex genotype phenotype relationship. Okay? So these are the drawbacks of the linear mix model. So it would be idea to introduce a method that could borrow strengths from both methods, right? So this is that. So this motivates us to develop uh, uh, the kernel new network method. It is able to model the complex relationship between genetic variants and the disease outcome. Uh, and it's designed for high dimensional you know, risk prediction analysis involves the millions of things. Okay. And to solve the computational issue, we also implement the mean Q and the mini batch training in kernel new network to accelerate the parameter it's making make it applicable to large scale data sets with millions of samples. Okay, so let's introduce the kernel neural network. So similar as the linear mix model, the kernel neural network first summarizes millions of SNP into the input kernel matrices. Okay, input kernel matrices. And based on these input kernel matrices, we generate uh, the hidden units, mu1 to mu m. Okay. And based on these uh, hidden units, we construct uh, we call the hidden kernels uh, by using a nonlinear kernel. Okay, nonlinear kernel, for example, the polynomial kernel. Now, in this case, the hidden kernel we, I cannot use in a linear kernel, otherwise it will collapse to the linear mix model. Okay, so this has to be a nonlinear kernel. And similar to the uh, uh, new network, uh, these hidden Kernels is used to capture the complex feature, okay? Non additive and uh, non linear features, like right? for example, the interaction between the genetic variables, okay? And we can use in the hidden kernel to model Y. Model y. <coughs> now, the kernel neural network can also be viewed as extension of the linear mix model, right? If we remove the middle part, the hidden layer and the direct link the Y to the input matrix. This is just the linear mix model, right? We just introduce the hidden kernel to capture the complex feature. 
The hierarchical structure of the kernel neural network are also very similar to the hierarchical structure of the neural network, except that the inputs and the hidden units are now replaced by the matrices, right? replaced by the input matrices and also the uh, hidden matrices. Okay. And again, if we remove the hidden layer or just choosing the linear kernel uh, as a hidden kernel, then this becomes a linear mix model. Okay, this becomes a linear mix model. So the idea of the kernel neural network uh, is quite a straightforward. However, fitting the neural network, kernel neural network is uh, a difficult uh, task uh, as it involves high dimension integration with respect to the hidden units. Right, and these hidden units are embedded in the kernel matrix, so it's very difficult to integrate them out. So instead of using Remo, we use a MinQ algorithm, which is actually a pretty old algorithm, right? Developed by 1970. Uh, I'm not going to take a, a you know talk in detail about this MinQ algorithm because it's already established. Um, but I just want to mention some advantage of the MinQ. First, it has a closed form solution, right? So we all in, in genetics, we like closed form, right? Because it can calculate very computational efficient, right? Other nice property also including the unbiasedness and the no requirement of normality. Okay. So these are the uh, advantage of the mean Q. Okay, so we propose the kernel neural network and we propose the algorithm, right? Using mean Q to solve the kernel neural network. The nice thing of the kernel neural network is uh, we can theoretically up to, uh, it can reach high accuracy or have comparable accuracy uh, than the linear mix model. And this can be illustrated using the following figure where we only have one input kernel and one hidden kernel. Okay. So there's two paths to link the input kernel with uh, uh, the phenotype Y. The linear model, linear mix model took this direct path. Uh, which only consider linear effect. Okay? And the kernel neural network took this uh, alternative path through the KMU, the hidden kernel. And the hidden kernel can capture additional nonlinear and interaction fact. So that uh, makes the kernel neural network out from the dynamics model. Okay? So we conduct the simulation study to evaluate the new method and compare it with the linear mix model. Uh, we use the genetic data from the UK Bar Bank to mimic the real data scenario. Uh, so more specifically, we, uh, we conduct a one thousand replicates for each of the simulations. And for each of the replicates, we sampled 6,000 uh, individuals and 10,000 uh, SNPs from UK Bar Bank. Okay. And we divide the data into training and testing, training with uh, about 5,000 individuals and uh, testing with 1,000 individuals. Okay. And based on the genetic data, we can simulate the phenotype by introducing nonlinear and interaction effects. Uh, and uh, for all simulation, to be clear, we're using linear kernel for both linear mixed model and the kernel neural network and with polynomial order two. That's our so the first simulation is uh, consider linear relationship, linear genotype phenotype relationship and the nonlinear for nonlinear genotype and the phenotype relationship. And when the underlying relationship is linear, these two methods have a compare performance. Although the kernel neural network uh, is computationally more efficient than the linear mix model. This is mainly because it's use a closed form solution, right? The linear mix model is in Remo, which is the iterative process. And for all the nonlinear relationship, uh, we found the kernel neural network uh, outperformed the linear mix model in terms of the prediction error, correlation, and the computational efficiency. Simulation two, we consider Interaction effect, I introduced two way interaction, three way interaction, and uh, I, by adding additional quadratic and cubic terms. Uh, and as we expected, uh, kernel neural network outperformed the linear mix model in terms of the prediction error correlation and computational time. So, through 
these two application uh, simulation we demonstrate uh, some of the advantage of the kernel neural network in 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 the computational interfaces, right? The computational advantage. Now, however, it still cannot direct that. Oh, question? For the previous slide, when you say interaction, what do you mean by interaction? Interaction across oh, SNP? Uh, just simulation. Simulation are adding the, you know, for example, we adding the cross product, right? So this is a multiple interaction we use. So not only the main effect, we also consider pairwise interaction effect and uh, three-way and three-way interaction fact. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Okay, so it's still cannot directly apply to uh, larger bank data, right? Because you know, it's involved converting a 500K times 500K matrix. Uh, to solve this problem, we use a simple but uh, effective approach called the bad training. Uh, the idea is borrowed from the graded stochastic gradient descent algorithm using in the neural network. Okay. So the basic idea is instead of fitting the model to the entire data set, we divide the data set into many batches and apply the method to each mini batch. Okay. So in more detail, if we have the large scale data set, we first shuffle the data, okay? And divide the, the data into equal sample size, many batches, okay? Many batches. Uh, we then apply the kernel neural network to each batch and estimate the, the parameters of their component estimate. And by taking the average of the estimate, we can show it's converged to the true parameter based on the uh, larger sample theory. Okay. Moreover, since the uh, uh, mean uh, can and use the mean Q algorithm, which has a closed form algorithm, we actually can run these analysis simultaneously. Uh, use parallel computing, so this uh, substantially reduce the sample size, uh, reduce uh, the computation time, which we'll show later on. Okay, so we can now simulation to evaluate the performance of the uh, mini batch training by adding the result from the batch training to the nonlinear effect simulation. So we just focus on the result from uh, KNN with the whole data set and the KNN with the batch training. Okay, batch training. So as we can see, overall, these two have a similar result. Right, similar performance. Although the result from the batch training is subject to a slightly high variation because it's using less sample size. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, the you know one advantage of the mini batch training is the substantial reduced uh, computational time. Right. Uh, previously, you need to invert in. Uh, in this case, is five hundred five thousand times five thousand matrix. Right. In this case, we divided the uh, two 10 batches. So you only need to invert in a 500 times 500, which substantially reduces computational time. Okay. It only needs a few seconds to run batch chaining. Uh, however, to fit a kernel neural network with the entire sample, it generally requires 50 seconds. Okay. The trend can be more clearly seen. Uh, by using the following simulation, where we vary the both study sample size and uh, batch size. Okay, give an example. When the study sample size is 8,000, we consider 10 batch, 20 batch, 40 batch, 80 batch. So for 10 batch, we have 800 for each batch and 400 for each batch, 200 for each batch, 100 for each batch. Okay. Now, with the increase of sample size and the increase of the batch size, the result from the batch training is close to the whole sample. It's the whole sample. So we do recommend at least 500 to have a result close to the whole data set. Uh, and also for the computational time, uh, with the increased sample size, uh, the batch training almost remains the similar computation time. However, the computation time required for the whole data set can uh, increase dramatically. Right? If you have 8,000, 
it is increased to 200. Okay. And with, when, when you increase the sample size, it, all, it further increase the computational time. Okay. okay, so finally we apply the approach to uh, uh, whole genome sequencing data from ADNI and uh, also the GWAS data from the UK Park Bank. Uh, ADNI is a small data set uh, with uh, nearly about one sound individual. So we can direct apply these two methods uh, without using the batch training. So for this analysis, we consider three input kernel. Okay. The covariance kernel matrix, which is the linear kernel I showed before. Okay. And the genetic relationship kernel matrix, and uh, that kernel is mainly try to capture the rare variants. Okay. Rare variants, because this is sequencing data, so we also want to capture the effect on the rare variants. Uh, the RBS kernel has some biology meaning, you know, it's classified as RBD, so uh, we also include it there. Uh, and for the output kernel, we use the polynomial order two. Uh, for the phenotype of interest, we consider three volume measures of a coordinate region, which is a campus, ventricle, and a whole brain volumes. Okay. So we fit a both method on any data and build a uh, risk prediction model. And uh, both risk prediction model has good performance. Uh, however, uh, the risk prediction model from the kernel neural network outperformed the linear mix model in terms of uh, average mean square errors. We also apply both method with uh, batch training to the whole genome data from UK by bank, investing the prediction model for bipolar, hypertension, cigarette smoking, and cannabis use. Uh, so before performing the analysis, we do the quality control, remove markers and the uh, samples with uh, low quality. We also remove the individuals that are correlated. But one thing I want to mention is uh, actually both methods are very easy to consider the correlated sample, right? It's just adding uh, one more matrix, a kinship matrix, you introduce one various component and they can easily handle the correlated uh, samples. Now, however, you know, in, since uh, dealing with the correlated sample is not a focus on our study and also to be consistent with the simulation. So in this case, we just remove them, right? But it's very easy to send to the family data and the correlated, correlated data. So after quality, Control, uh, we have about 375 individual and uh, 460K genetic markers remain for the analysis. The full simplicity for this analysis, we use the linear kernel as the input kernel for both linear mix model and network. And for the output kernel, we use the polynomial order two and order three. Okay. So for both hypertension and bipolar, we found the current neural network, with, especially current neural network with the uh, output kernel as the polynomial order three, outperformed the linear mix model. So this may indicate that there are some nonlinear and uh, interaction effect, right? although the effect is probably not that strong. Uh, however, for smoking and the cannabis use, uh, we found that there's almost no difference. Okay, so this may suggest there's no, you know, nonlinear effect or interaction effect. Uh, another possibility is due to the limitation of the method. Okay. So similar as most of the machine learning method, kernel neural network could also suffer from the curse of dimensionality, which means when the P increases, especially in this case, we use a whole genome data, right? Almost uh, millions of the steps. Uh, uh, the performance could uh, dramatically reduce with the increase of the, with the dimension. So make it the, similar as the linear mix model. Right? So one of the extension we use here is uh, propose a new method to solve this problem. It's called the Penrise uh, Kernel Neural Network. But before I go into that, uh, I, you know, is there any question for the first uh, project? Let me check the card. Should I just stop? 
So at like 12.15 or 12.20. Oh, 12.15, okay. Um, let me uh, first ask a question and then go to the next topic. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you said the feature has, uh, high, dim has high dimensionality. Okay. Is the input data sparse or not? Oh, that's a good question. Um, input data, input data in this case is, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So the input data is zero, one, two. The sparsity is actually the matrix. When you take the whole genome-wide data, right, and you take the average, you can see that, I mean, if you calculate the relationship between yourself, so the diagonal of the matrix, right, will be, keep as example one, right, keep, that does not change. But the off diagonal, it will become very sparse. So, yeah, it actually will eventually converge it to zero. So it, this will become the identity matrix and which uh, does not provide any information, not provide any information. So, so this, uh, this probably one reason cause, cause the low performance of the kernel new network when the P is very large. So could you ex explain how the input data looks like? Oh, the input data is just zero, one, two. Zero, one, two. Uh, and then you take the product, and especially you have a lot of zero. So many things will be, you know, if you take the product, right, it will be zero, will be zero. But if you take the center, the probability will be the better. But this will be a value, uh, for example, less than uh, zero, one, two, two, uh, well, less than two, less than two. And then you take the average and uh, this, you know, the off diagonal, you take the average, then many of them will be zero, some will be one, some will be two, four. But if you take the average, then eventually, if the P increase, it will towards zero. So it's, is it a good idea to uh, consider dimensionality reduction techniques? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. so the next project is uh, doing that. <laughs> yeah, reduce the dimensionality. Now, if you focus on one gene, if, you know, hundreds of SNPs and uh, focus on one sound SNP, don't have this issue. I mean, the off-diagonal still has information, but if it's really high dimension, they're not providing enough information. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, for the for the matrix K, it's a very dense matrix um, independently of um, the um, coding. So it will have barely have any zero in it. Um, the other thing is that um, because it measures the added, because you are using identity by state. So right. then definitely all the off diagonal element will not be zero. And there will be values between all of them. They don't go above one because you are measuring the genetic similarity or the additive genetic similarity between two individuals. So it has to be between zero and one. So. Um, so that's a, a comment regarding the um, the matrix. I, I'm a little bit when you use the nonlinear um, uh, scenarios where you use the linear on A, which is the genetic effect, then the square, the cubic, and so on. I mean, realistically, those extreme situation when you start looking within the context of um, genetics, because uh, those changes are not exponential, even when they are not linear. So if you use a less than um, quadratic uh, change on the effect from linearity, have you looked at something intermediate between linear and, and quadratic and compared the performance of using linear model versus the kernel approach? Okay, so, so I want to first, uh, you know, kind of will clarify your first question is right. I mean, it's not necessarily zero, but you can see the magnitude of the diagonal and off diagonal are very different, you know, because if you take the average, the diagonal, when you take an average of all steep, this almost remain unchangeable. And, but the off diagonal is decay very quickly. So that makes it, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, no information. It's mainly dominated by the diagonal. And for the, Right. Uh, the diagonal is the relationship of the individual with itself. So it will be always around one plus right. minus inbreeding. 
Um, right. so the off-diagonal, it measures the additive relationship between two individuals. So right. if two individuals are not related by blood, very likely the off-diagonal element would be small. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But Especially it will never go to zero. It never goes to zero. It's just like, like you're yeah, right. It's just the magnitude. It's just yeah. uh, compared with the diagonal, yeah. So the second question, uh, we, we actually did not, uh, you know, pay too much attention, you know, you know, the systematic model, we just randomly choose different uh, nonlinear patterns. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we actually based on paper, I think, wow, for the curve, and, you know, they have some uh, biology meanings. Um, uh, um, you know, we, we did not uh, try something in the middle. <laughs> In the middle, we just, just choose some of the nonlinear function. But I would imagine if something in the middle, like uh, you know, it's kind of a both have a linear and a nonlinear effect, uh, then you know the the difference would not be that uh, that change much change much. Yeah, I mean, the, it still probably has some advantage because there's some nonlinear effect, but it really depends on how much nonlinear effect there. If the nonlinear effect is not that uh, significant, then these two will become Comparable, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, other questions? Next question. Okay. So, if no more questions, I, I will move to the some of the extension. And this is uh, really dealing with the high dimensionality issue. So, uh, so in this method, instead of we fit a kernel matrix on all the SNPs, we first divide uh, the all SNP into different sets. So this and this is based on the biology, right? You can uh, define a set as a gene, uh, pathway, uh, chromosome, or function, right? Uh, so this could be substantially reduced uh, the dimension uh, for the kernel matrix. So, for example, if we, you know, based on the uh, set, based on gene set, then probably vary from you know, uh, tens to probably thousands uh, in each of the kernels. So, substantially reduce uh, dimensionality. So, for each of set, we fit uh, uh, input the kernel matrix, matrix. Uh, and then based on these input matrices, we can fit the neural network. However, this brings another issue is uh, we could have a lot of set, right? For the gene, we could have, you know, could have hundreds or even thousands of the genes, right? So the model complexity could be increased dramatically. To control the model complexity, we using different penalties to control the model complexity. We consider lasso penalty, uh, elastic penalty, and uh, rate penalty. Okay. Um, and we conduct a simulation to compare the penalize the kernel neural network with the uh, two existing method, the penalized linear model, and the original kernel neural network, which don't use penalty and uh, just fit all the sleep in 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 one input kernels. Okay. Uh, so overall, uh, the kernel the penalized the kernel neural network with the rich penalty outperform other penalties and also outperform the uh, two existing method. And uh, this is for nonlinear uh, relationship and also the interaction relationship. And more importantly, if we use main Q and use the uh, rich, we have cross form. We can derive a cross form. So the computational uh, efficiency is also the best among all the uh, penalties and uh, also better than the uh, Paris 2 method. <laughs> so for the real data analysis, we apply the penalized kernel neural network to predict the outcome of a pen imaging uh, using the whole genome sequencing data from the any data. So for this analysis, we just focus on 10 genes. Uh, and uh, those are gene appearance report associated with uh, this uh, pet imaging outcome. 
So based on the result, uh, we can we found uh, the penalized uh, kernel neural network with different penalty has a comparable performance, right? And in most case, uh, they outperform the penalized linear model uh, and uh, the original kernel neural network without a penalty, like, except for the first case, I think see. First case uh, is uh, the panel imaging try to detect uh, the amyloid beta load. Uh, and in this case, uh, there's superior performance, which probably suggests there's not much of the nonlinear action fact. However, for the remaining three ones, uh, there might be some of the linear and the non and the action fact. Okay, so do I have time to go next next topic? Or should, yeah, like, should I leave to questions? Like four, like four minutes. Summer. Um, okay, I will very quickly uh, discuss the final final extensions. Okay, so for most of the genetic research, they are more interested in the detecting or testing a gene. Right, or search for a new gene related with disease rather than risk prediction, risk prediction mainly for conditions. Um, so to facilitate the genetic association analysis, consider nonlinear and intention factor, we also develop a kernel neural network based test. And th this is uh, developed based on the iterative mean Q. So it's a kind of variation of the mean Q. Iterative mean Q is obtained by repeating the mean Q process until it's converged. Okay, and uh, there's a connection with the uh, mean Q, iterative mean Q with Ramos, so it should be equivalent performance. Okay, but the nice thing of the iterative mean Q is that it has the nice asymptotic properties, especially normality. Okay, so the estimate from iterative mean Q follows the normal distribution. Okay, so therefore we can develop a test uh, to, to type to what type of test to test uh, the genetic effect. So in a simple case, if the input kernel is linear and output kernel is a polynomial of two, we actually can expand the, the model and it has a four variance component. The first is for the J matrix, which is kind of like for the intercept. Okay? Second one is for the linear effect, theta two here for the linear effect. And the theta three is for the non-linear and uh, intact chain effect. Okay, so theta three. And of course, the theta four is for the random error, which are, we are not interested. So we can build a two word test to test the linear effect and the nonlinear and the intact effect. Okay. And of course, we also can build the uh, overall test, which follows a chi squared distribution with two degree freedom. Okay, just combine both uh, linear and nonlinear effect. So we conduct simulation to show the kernel neural network based testing. The simulation setting is the same, similar as to the previous uh, simulation, except we only randomly draw one sound individual. Right? And we don't really need to split the data set because now we are doing the uh, association test, right? Uh, and we vary the SNP size. And we compare our method to scatter. Scatter right now is the most dominant method for gene set analysis. So we first evaluate their type of arrow. Uh, if we focus, focus on the overall versus the scat, uh, for different sample uh, snake size, uh, our mass overall control type of arrow very well. It should be close to 0 0.05. However, when the increase snake size, uh, scat tend to be, become consultative. This is mainly because uh, you know there's a plug-in uh, estimate the issues and uh, make the scat that are following is to high square distribution, so it tends to be more conductive. Okay. Uh, and also, we evaluate the power of this method um, by simulating different uh, linear, nonlinear, and intaction effect. Okay. So, in this simulation, let's focus on just the overall test, which is in red, and uh, scat. Result from scatter, which is purple. Okay. So when the underlying relationship is linear, uh, as we can see, when the slip size is small, they have compared performance, right? Because it's linear. So scatter support works very well. However, when the slip increases, then 
power must be out of the scat. Scat has reduced the power. This is mainly because it's a uh, tangent Okay. Uh, and for all the nonlinear relationship and uh, interaction, uh, our method uh, outperformed the scat. Uh, this is mainly uh, there's a nonlinear effect, and the scat using the linear kernel really cannot capture the nonlinear effect. So uh, we have a much better power than the scat method, especially when the snip size increase. Scat almost close to ten my hairs. Uh, finally, we apply the uh, the method to the UK bar bank and search for a new gene associated with the hepatitis pollen. So we first, you know, uh, extract the genes based on the annotations. So there's around the uh, 28 genes, and uh, we apply the both method scat and uh, our method on each gene and calculate the p value. So overall, our result are actually quite close to the scat. Although in some of the gene, we outperform, you know, the new mass outperform the scat. For example, in this case, right, outperform, we have a significant p-value than the scat. This is mainly due to the nonlinear effect. So there might be some nonlinear effect or interaction effect between the SNPs in that gene, right? And there's some other cases also. Although this result still need to be replicated and also you know, need to be uh, looking to the biology of the genes related with campus problems. Okay. So finally, I want to acknowledge uh, my students. Uh, uh, you know, most of this works are mainly done by my graduate students, right? I just provide the idea and they did the majority of work. Uh, and also I want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators. And uh, hope you have a nice Thanksgiving holidays. <laughs>
if there are no questions, well, let's give a round of applause. I just saw, I can't remember if I signed up. I did sign up, but I might have forgotten to sign up this time because I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to Okay. I will just come with yeah. okay. I just might be eating there. I'm just sitting there with my little bird. Yeah. 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 Yeah.